Here's another show you can enjoy in the True Story FM family of entertainment podcasts. Hey, Pete, ever wonder what Steven Spielberg's favorite film is? You know, Andy, I've heard he loves classics like Lawrence of Arabia, Meet Me in St. Louis. Imagine chatting with him about why those films resonate with him so much. That's exactly what we do on our podcast, Movies We Like. We've had incredible guests like actress Dee Wallace, cinematographer Eric Messerschmidt, director Steve Miner, and former Disney animators Tom and Tony Bancroft. They share their favorite films and the impact they've had on their careers, offering fast Fascinating insights into the craftsmanship and storytelling techniques that make these movies so special. If you're curious about the magic behind the scenes, subscribe to Movies We Like from True Story FM on your favorite podcast app. New episodes are released on the fourth Monday of each month with early access for our members. Join us on Movies We Like as we explore the movies we all like with the people who make them. And Stephen, our people will call your people. Let's make this happen, puppy. Subscribe today. What's up, Most Excellent Friends? It's Chrissy and Nathan from the Most Excellent 80s Movies Podcast. It's a podcast where a filmmaker and a comedian and their most excellent guests adventure their way through the 80s movies we think we love or might have missed with our grown-up eyes to see how they hold up. Join us for delightful discussion. Rollicking recaps. Ratings and deep cut recommendations. Plus, members get some extra fun chit-chat with the hosts after the show. Download the most excellent 80s movies podcast today at truestory.fm. Or find it wherever the finest podcasts are stored. And do remember to keep the most excellent 80s movies podcast motto in mind. Be excellent to each other and... Party on. Party on, dudes. Dudes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this rebroadcast episode of the Star Wars Generations podcast. A while ago, I was chatting with my friend AJ Starkiller. He has a great presence on TikTok and Twitter, if you've seen him there. And we're talking about this idea of what would happen to the memory of Dooku after the Clone Wars in those early days of the Empire. Uh, It led to a great conversation, though, about how would he be remembered? And what does that say about the understanding people in the Empire as it became the Empire had of everything that went on? It was a great conversation. I'm sharing it with you again here between myself, Aaron McGowan, and AJ Starkiller. As always, if you enjoy this, you want more of this kind of content, please think about becoming a member. It's only $5 a month, $55 a year. All the information is in the show notes. Also there, you'll find all the ways to contact us, Facebook, Twitter, email, TikTok. We love to hear from you. We love to hear your feedback, and we'll be talking about it soon. So thank you all so much. Uh, Enjoy this episode. We have spoken. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of the Star Wars Universe podcast. Today we're talking about Count Dooku, and a specific question of... How would he and the Separatist movement be remembered in the Star Wars universe now that we're in the time of the Empire? Uh, This came up from a great series of TikToks that uh, my friend uh, AJ Jedi Starkiller put up that I had some fun responding to and turned to some great discussions on both TikTok and Twitter. And we decided it would be a fun thing to to explore for – a fun thing to explore further. So I'm here with AJ and Aaron McGowan, my normal Bad Batch co-host. My normal Bad Batch co-host, and we'll be diving into all of that right after this commercial break. We have no control over. Welcome back. My name is Matthew. I'm your host. Use they, them pronouns. I'm joined by two great guests. First, we've got AJ Starkiller. AJ, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, I am AJ A. Um a.k.a. Jedi underscore Starkiller, pretty much everywhere better content creators are found. Um, and I am just happy, as always, to be back here again. So thank you again, Matthew, for having me back. My pleasure. And uh, Lady McGowan, how are we doing today? Yes, um, I'm doing good. Um, I'm Lady period Tano period creates on both TikTok and Instagram. I'm not cool enough to have a Twitch or anything like that yet. And Twitter eludes me for some reason. Mm -hmm. Like, even with being young, it overwhelms me. You're Um, wise to stay away. Yeah. Okay, good. (laughs) Um, I'm really excited about this. I was so excited when the Tales of the Jedi was split half Ahsoka, half Dooku, because Ahsoka is my very favorite. I cosplay her. But um, I was just so excited to learn more about Dooku and actually add more depth to his character. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, he has always been one of my favorite characters. And you both have probably heard at some point or another of my rants about how I think his character is much better 
if he's not also Darth Tyrannus, you know, if he is genuinely believing that the Republic is corrupt and the Jedi are corrupt, which, both of which are true. And I'll, I'll save my rant because it'll come up in the episode. But AJ, let, this, that's part of why I was so excited when you started that discussion. So why don't you just kind of give a summary for those who weren't following us on, on TikTok or Twitter? Uh, what, what was the point you were making about Dooku and sort of where you're going with that and the questions you were asking? It all began with episode two of the Bad Batch season two where we saw the um, governor of whatever planet it was that escapes me. Um, And she was talking about how Count Dooku was right. And those four words just like stuck in my head. And I started to wonder, I was like, from a certain perspective in the galaxy, specifically those who are anti-imperial, who don't know that Count Dooku is Darth Tyrannus, they're going to look at it, and even if you didn't agree with Dooku during the war, all of a sudden, this man is a prophet. He told you the Republic was evil. He told you the Republic was going to do some corrupt things, and he was right. So I really started to wonder, and I coupled this with other information, um from other sources as well, like some that didn't make it into TikTok, but made it on YouTube. But um, the idea is that there are multiple legacies that Count Dooku could have. And some might see him just as, you know, the, the crazy merciless leader of the CIS, but others might see him as the first rebel icon, the first anti-imperialist. And the way that history as a historian the way that history is is written and remembered in the moment and in the future is just one of the most fascinating things to me and i agree with you matthew that him being darth tyrannus george really sealed his fate by making him a sith and it it just sucks some of the nuance out of this character and i'm glad to see it being injected in other media as well yeah i mean i think one of the reasons why i jumped on that conversation so quickly was because i thought you were making such good points and i hadn't really connected it to you know how is the clone war going to be remembered because you know the the overarching story and i think the bad batch has has done a great job of helping us to see this is that you know, Palpatine's plan was was right, that you have a, a terrible war and this terrible devastation, and people, like, historically have always turned to strongmen figures, uh, authoritarians, after terrible wars, after terrible depressions, after corruption, because it's that, you know, oh, at least they make the trains run on time kind of horribleness. And, but I, I the one of my frustrations throughout the, the Star Wars story had been that I never really felt like it, it felt to me like Lucas and the writers, especially of the Clone Wars and, and of the prequel movies, couldn't quite make up their mind about what the Separatists were doing, you know? And that and, – and I'm curious, uh, maybe the, cause I, there's such an overarching discussion, I want to kind of break it down a bit. So maybe let's just start here. Like just with the prequels, I remember – Watching that second movie and hearing Dooku's speech to Obi-Wan when Obi-Wan is kind of tied up with the, the Force Manacles, you know, um, when Obi-Wan is kind of tied up in the Force Manacles or Energy Manacles, whatever they are, and everything Dooku is saying is, is right. And I'm like, this is a really interesting story here. And then we get to the third movie and it's just the Separatists are bad. They're separating. They, they, they can't be allowed to do this. What, what was kind of both of your, your take on that in terms of like, why did you ever sort of have, have yourself wondering, like, why is the separate so bad? Why is it so bad if people want to leave the Republic? I will say for me, since I was pretty young when those movies were coming out, I like don't remember that conversation. I don't remember the first time I saw it. I just remember being like, oh, he has Obi-Wan trapped, therefore he's bad. Mm, like, I didn't yeah. pick up on mm-hmm. any of that. Until I watched it again this year. And I was like, oh, my God, Dooku was right. <laughs> like, yeah, it was just crazy rewatching that and realizing how much you miss when you're a kid. Like, even watching The Clone Wars the first time. For me, it was Separatist bad, Republic good, Jedi good. Even when they're 
stepping all over all these people, even when they're fueling everything with their ego and just doing what they believe is right, even when they're propping up corrupt senators. Like, from my point of view, I was just like, okay, cool. Yeah, separate is bad, republic good. Yeah. And so it's been like a journey for me this last year getting into the prequels again and right now I'm rewatching Clone Wars again and especially with Bad Batch just seeing like oh right the republic becomes the empire. Republic bad. Like separatists kind of had a point. It wasn't articulated super clearly in the prequels, but they had a point. I would argue that it wasn't articulated at all in the prequels. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> that's like that's why the prequel era is probably, I mean, maybe now with the High Republic, not so much, but the prequel era has traditionally been my favorite era. But the movies just don't explain anything. Yeah. Like, you're right. Like, that speech where, where Dooku tells Obi-Wan everything. What if I told you the Republic was under the command of a Sith Lord? Like, why does he tell him that? That never comes up again. Like, you mean to tell me Obi-Wan didn't go home and be like, so Count Dooku was telling me something. Like, yeah. no, it just, like, gets dropped. And then, like, we're like, aha, Count Dooku, mustache-twirling villain. And it's like... Mm -hmm. It, it just so much is left on the floor and it's interesting like thanks to tales of the jedi we're finally seeing it in in live action media but count dooku is this like incredibly multifaceted character with so many layers but if you just watch the movies even if you add in the clone wars it's he's just a paper thin old mustache twirling villain yeah who does have a really cool trick with his lightsaber, if you listen to our last Bad Batch episode. But yeah, other than that, and it's funny because for the most part, I, I'm not the sort of person who's like, oh, bring back the Legends canon. Like, I think it would have been too unwieldy to deal with. I'm okay that it was mostly gotten rid of. But there's some parts of it that I think were so brilliant. And, and one of them is, have either of you read the book Darth Plagueis? I knew that was coming up. Yes. So one of the things I love in that book is it shows Jedi Master Dooku having these conversations with Senator Palpatine, along with uh, Higo Damask, who's the, the person who's also Darth Plagueis, before he becomes a Sith, where he's expressing his frustration. And his frustrations are that the Republic is corrupt, and the Republic is using the Jedi as their personal military. And like one thing I'd never really thought of is that the idea that the thing that, at least in those books, drives Dooku over the edge is it's that one more Jedi dies because of the Republic using the Jedi, and it's Qui-Gon, mm -hmm. who is Dooku's own Padawan. You know, he's not a Padawan by then, obviously, but like, and that it's Dooku is so mad about this, and that Dooku is starting to think, we, there is this terrible evil, and what if the Jedi don't have enough power? And that there's a great scene with him and Palpatine where he's like, you know, maybe I need to start looking at some of the powers that the Jedi don't allow me to use. And you just hear these great echoes of when Palpatine then later says to Anakin, like, there are some things that the Jedi would consider unnatural or whatever. Um, and yeah, it, it's that – that has always really informed my idea of Dooku as this person who is not just mustache and, – and maybe he gets he gets corrupted and I, I, I can accept him eventually becoming a Sith. But I just want more of that – that he gets corrupted because he has legitimate reasons to be angry. He has legitimate reasons to be upset. Speaking of Twitter, I made a, a com I made a post on Twitter where I talked about how Dooku and Anakin mirror each other so well because they are both men who saw the flaws in the system and wanted to change it, but their solution was fascism. Like their solution, both of them came to the wrong conclusion about how to fix things. And it's it's especially interesting when you realize that. Anakin seeks, he starts out wanting to stop Dooku and at the end essentially becomes him. Right. I think there's a great point there, especially in that, I think this is true even in our own world. A lot of times the first thing that radicalizes people, and this can be in, in any direction, but especially unfortunately towards authoritarianism, is when they do try to use more like legit you know, the, like Dooku and Anakin both try to work within the system and say, hey, I see these problems. I want to change these things. And they're shut down. 
and they're told not to ask those questions. They're told not to think about these things. And mm-hmm. and I'm not excusing them for a second. I'm not excusing anyone who turns towards authoritarianism. But I think it's important to notice that that can be a cause, you know? It's the story of falling to the alt-right pipeline that is the prequels. Like, that's the whole point. Like, I had that realization with Anakin a couple days ago where I've always been hung up on the line, uh, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. And I was always like, but how? Like, what have we seen that shows you the Jedi are evil in any capacity? But then I realize that's the point. He's been so gaslit, so far down this pipeline that he's just regurgitating these things that Palpatine has taught him without even thinking about it at this point. Like, that's the danger, is that if you don't stop it before it gets to a certain point, they become that far gone. And it's the same thing that Dooku did. Dooku started out being this idealist, you know, who wanted the best, but, like, at the end of the day... It, it He was too far gone. And I wish we had had a moment. I think you could argue that that moment is the moment he looks over at Palpatine before Anakin cuts his head off. That's the moment where Dooku goes, oh, I made a mistake. Like, I, and like legitimately, like, I've gone down the wrong path. And I mean, there's a something to be said about what I assume is an unintentionally beautiful metaphor about you often don't realize when you've gone too far down the path until that moment. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's an argument, but I noticed earlier today I was watching the Tales of the Jedi, the Dooku episodes, and um, <clears throat> he says to Yaddle, she's saying, he she sees him meeting with Sidious, and she's like, Step to me, Dooku, you know, we'll fight him together. Whatever crimes, they'll be forgiven. And Dooku says, I'm afraid. And she goes, I know you are. And he goes, I'm afraid it's too late. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think he already almost realizes and understands. He says, like, I've betrayed everything I know and everything that I trust because, like, it's just – this is wrong. What's happening is wrong and I need to change it somehow. And the only way I can think of is just to gain power and force it to be changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think he – understands that it's not like the correct or the right way to go. But yeah, maybe he doesn't personalize it or realize that like he has made a mistake. It's funny. When I first heard that line in Tales of the Jedi, it's one of my favorite lines because the echo that I immediately heard was, it is too late for me, son, when Mm. Vader says that. And of Mm. course, we learned that that's too late. And like, I don't don't blame Yaddle for this. She doesn't have that relationship with Dooku. But it makes you wonder like – could a Luke have turned Dooku, you know? Um, I, I think I think it's also a reference very subtly to the fact that at this point he's killed his best friend. I think Sifo Diaz, like at some point in between these moments, he has killed Sifo Diaz and he has erased, we saw him erase the Camino from the archives. And if you mm-hmm. read Dooku Jedi Lost, that was his best friend. That was his only yeah. friend. And I think that's what he really means when he's like, it's too late for me, because he's that's how far he's been willing to go is he killed the only person who really mattered to him. And now and now Qui-Gon is gone, too. Like the, the three people who have meant the most to him in this world are all gone. We don't know what happened to Rail Avaros, his first Padawan, but assuming he's probably gone or somewhere in the ether as well. Yeah, I was Qui Gon being the other one because mm-hmm. Qui-Gon, the, the relationship between Qui Gon. Uh, there's, there's so much there I want to see further explored. That's my favorite relationship in Star Wars. Dooku and Qui Gon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Well, and so let's let's get back to just the way that the story frames it because I think um, I, I want to talk more about why we think the Separatists could have some real points, although clearly also have some real problems to be sure. But I want to talk about just about the way that like. Star Wars tells us the story of the Separatists. Because one thing I noticed, is that there's two things I think that they do to, to really show how evil the Separatists are, at least why we're supposed to think they're bad. I'm curious your thoughts on them. And one of it is, and, and this is very subtle, it may only be really picked up by people who are really historians. This one feels very subtle, but they frame it very much in the language of the American Civil War. Like, they're separatists. They want to, you know, secede from the Republic. But then what's the name of the, the army? It's the Grand Army of the Republic, 
Who are they fighting? The Confederacy of independent systems. Like, there are so many of these little things that they do to frame it. And I think there is some discussion in some of the novels about how some parts of the the people who become the separatists want to, like, st- you know, the Republic is out there, like, trying to fight slavery. Like, it doesn't get to Tatooine, sadly, but there are anti-slavery laws. And like, some of the people in the Confederacy want to keep, you know, get rid of those laws. Um, did did you all catch either that specific stuff or just like other stuff that was kind of being done to sort of frame these two sides as good and evil? I never caught on to that, um, like the Confederacy versus the Grand Army of the Republic. But I think it just says a lot about like the subliminal messaging they gave. Mm-hmm. Because like, I mean, I know history. I know how the Civil War went. And them just stating it like that clearly played into my initial belief of like, Separatist bad, Republic good. Yeah, and it also plays very much um, with the fall of the USSR and, like, Mm -hmm. the split there um, on the economic side of things. Like, there's a lot of... Oh, yeah. The the part that doesn't... Like, you're right about the, the slaves' rights, kind of the states' rights to what argument with the Confederacy of Independent Systems, but... A lot of it is framed through the concept of economics, which, again, also the Civil War. People like to say, oh, well, they were going to destroy the South's economy. And it's like, well, why would that destroy the South's economy? But um, there, you see this through throughout history with a lot of civil wars, um, this concept of like almost egalitarian rule, like this idea that the Confederacy just wants to be able to run their businesses the way that they want to run their business. It's things like the Trade Federation. That's the excuse. But I do agree that the the problem with the storytelling is that we aren't given a reason why the Republic doesn't want them to separate. Why can't the Republic do business with the confederacy if they are a separate entity like we know that you know the u.s it wouldn't work because we're all one you know we're one land mass we can think of a million reasons why the the civil war doesn't work but in a in a galaxy what is so egregious about the concept of splitting from the republic and while we can spitball some the story never really tells us we just yeah. see them go to war, and it's like, why? Yeah, you, you mentioned the economics, and that was going to be the second thing I brought up, is there's, there's kind of this sense of, like, it's all, like, robber baron, like, cap. In some ways, like, some of the leadership of the, 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 the separatists are basically the Ferengi, you know, in terms of they want just, like, no economic controls, and they want to be able to be all corporate and terrible, But again, like even in the Clone Wars, we do get episodes of just these planets that are not super tied up with the the corporate the the corporate alliance and the techno union and and the trade federation. They're just you know they just don't want to do what they just don't want to be part of the Republic. And it it always frustrated me because the Clone Wars would give us those stories, you know, and and but then go back to no, it's just all slavers and hyper libertarian corporate fascists and other terrible people. So I was going to bring up real quick, I just thought about this, going back to Dooku Jedi Lost, and it ties into this whole thing. Um, we see Dooku leave the Jedi Order in that book, specifically because his home planet, he doesn't want his home planet to be ignored by the Republic. One of the big events that we see in that book is there's a planet, there's a big explosion, big disaster happens, and the Republic only seems to care after they realize that the planet's resources are at harm, not the people. And so when Sereno goes under a similar disaster, Dooku's like, we don't need the Republic's help. We will take care of ourselves. And that is, it's interesting for two reasons, because one, it really does kind of set up why the separatists are a thing. Because at the end of the day, they don't see the Republic as caring about the people so much as they care about the resources. And the idea that now I'm piecing all this together as I'm talking, the idea that the the separatists are like, if you don't care about anything but our resources, why don't we just manage our own resources? We don't need you. Makes sense. But then what's, again, adding great irony 
in the second season of The Bad Batch is when we talk to the old man from Sereno, who's like, how do you think he got everything for his war by bleeding his planet dry? And so the idea that he started this war, at least conceptually, to protect these planets and their resources only to do the exact same thing, to drain that planet and its people. It's a beautiful irony. Yeah, that just makes me think of um, a quote that Dooku had um, in Tales of the Jedi about like his original stance, really. Um, it's in that first episode with him and Qui-Gon. They're on this planet that's being, in the same way, bled dry by the corrupt senator. And he's just stealing from his people. They're starving. And so they kidnap his son. And Dooku's protecting the townspeople because he doesn't believe they've done anything wrong. He sees how they've been hurt and how the senator is so corrupt. And he just, like, wants revenge. He wants to... No. Um, anyways, the senator says to him about the Jedi, you serve the Senate. Like, step to me, fight them, you serve the Senate. And Dugu says, no, we serve the people of the Republic. Because that's what he wants it to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it is. The Jedi are the lapdogs of the Republic. They are supporting a corrupt Senate. But Dooku doesn't realize that yet. Yeah. And, and I love that because, it, to me, it shows the complexity of Dooku's character. Because I think I'm certainly not going to stand here and say, oh, Dooku was this great revolutionary hero. He's not Che Guevara. He is a figure that we often see in revolutions. Like, you know, a, a big part of the American revolutions was like, they want, you know, they wanted the ability to exploit the natives a lot more than the British were letting them, you know, in, in that same kind of like we're saying about uh, Dooku. Uh, and, and I, I, but I think that, so he, he has all this multiplicity. And I think that really comes up with what you're saying, Aaron, of the, of the Jedi, in that he thinks the Jedi should serve the, the people of the Republic. But he also has this very noblesse oblige idea of like, because we are better than them, because we are wiser, because we are smarter, we have this duty to lead, this duty to control. And it's both – it's honorable that he doesn't want it to be for the Senate and their corruption, that he wants to help everybody else. But it's also kind of horrifying because it's also that idea of like, because we are the, the superiors, therefore it's our obligation to, to – we are the shepherds and they are the sheep kind of ideas. Hmm. I would actually argue that Che Guevara is the perfect analog to Dooku in terms of legacy. And what I mean is depending on what side of the aisle you fall on depends on whether or not you view Che as a hero or as a terrorist. Right. Because it is very polarizing, especially like within the Cuban government, within Cuban exiles. Like, I would argue that that is the perfect parallel to how Dooku is going to be viewed in the Star Wars universe. I now have this wonderful image of 19 year old, very privileged boys in the Star Wars universe who go off to the academy and have posters of Che up because they think they're hardcore, just like Che. Like, so let me ask you this then to go back to our Bad Batch, to our Bad Batch and our coverage. Would Nemec have a poster of Dooku up on his wall? <laughs> That's such a good question. I I want to know what Nemec's manifesto says about Dooku. I want to know what Luthen thinks about Dooku. Because philosophically, those are the same character. Mm -hmm. They are both mm -hmm. willing to burn down everything for their for their goal that they believe is the right goal. And to the opposite side, they're terrorists. So like I, I want to know what Nemec thinks. I want to know what Luthen thinks. Yeah, that's a good point that um, Dooku and Luthen really are the same. It's just different sides of the coin and how they're presented to us. Because they're literally, as you said, basically terrorists just like doing these extreme things against the government that they view as oppressive. Right. And in the prequel era, we're shown that the government – or we're led to believe that the government is not oppressive and that Dooku's the bad guy. And then it's flipped for Luthen when it could be seen the exact opposite way for either of them. Yeah. 
And I, I will just say also for anybody who feels attacked, know that my attacks there are very self-deferential. <laughs> I was the 19-year-old who was the head of the young communists at my college and had a picture of Che Guevara up on my wall because I was an idiot 19-year-old white boy. I still think Che is a hero but a very complicated character and that's a, a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I, 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 love the, I love this discussion because I think that's – and this kind of gets to the heart of, of what we're going to be talking about today, AJ, and what, what you're bringing up is that how history is remembered is so different. And this is, I think, the thing that I liked most about Andor is that to me, a big part of what Andor is saying is that, and this ties in a lot with Last Jedi, which I love so much, is that the way history gets remembered is always going to be so different, you know, and I, uh, than what actually happened. And to me, like, as someone who grew up in the original movies, like, if you ever, like, Empire, forget about Republic Separatists, Empire bad, Repu Rebellion, pure and good and right and noble and always walked old women across the street and never, you know, littered and just the perfect, perfect group of people. And so seeing Luthen be like, yeah, there are these 30 people who are going to go on a thing. We're going to sacrifice them because... <coughs> I get to decide who lives and dies to help fight this fight. It's horrifying. And then you think, but the Republic, the rebellion might not happen without him. And I, I love that point of that him and Dooku are very similar. So yeah, let's get into this. Like if, if we're in the early years of the empire, no one knows that Dooku is Tyrannus. They just know he was the leader of the separatists. Most people hated the separatists, but now the Republic has become the empire. First, let's talk about just among the former separatist worlds, where do you think their perspective is right now on Dooku, on the whole war they just fought, and on what's happening now? I think a lot of the separatist wars, or sorry, separatist worlds and sympathizers are going to be the first people to question the Empire and start the rebellion. <clears throat> like, whether we like it or not, I think... It just draws the um, comparison that the Republic was always corrupt. It kind of was always the Empire. It got worse, but the Separatists always did have a point. Maybe they should have rebelled, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like I said earlier, I think that he was, to them, Dooku was a prophet, you know? Um, but also... Um, one thing I would really like to get a little more of um, now that we're having this kind of conversation is Saw Gerrera specifically. Saw is one of my favorite mm -hmm. characters and Saw grew up actively fighting the Separatists. He hates everything the Separatists stood for. And now he's essentially a Separatist himself at this point. Like that is something that I really want to see more of from a character like that, not just from the separatist worlds themselves, but from the people who started off fighting against the separatists and are now the most anti-imperial. I would love to see it from Saw. The one I would really want to see it though from is Cham Syndulla. Mm. Uh, Hera's father. Mm. He's been the leader of this and a Twi'lek movement for, you know, generations who first they were fighting the Republic because they didn't want Ryloth to be part of the Republic. But then the Separatists took over and so he was fighting them. And then later he's fighting against the Empire. And it's just, you know, all he's ever cared about is Ryloth and protecting it from outside invasion or outside, inf uh, you know, uh, oppressors. And be I, I agree with you. I think people like them would start to question and be like, maybe Dooku had a point. I wonder, though, and I think we've seen a little bit of this in The Bad Batch. I think for a lot of the people in the separatist world who were not so, like, politically minded necessarily, like they were just living their lives, I wonder if they love the Empire. Because the thing is, the Republic was corrupt. The Empire is authoritarian. And there's a very big difference between those two things. They're very, very linked often. But especially in those early days, you know, it, it's I, – I, I keep using this, but, like, the Empire is making the trains <laughs> run on time. Is, the Empire is dealing with all those pirates and, and attackers and bandits who the Republic would never get around to dealing with. And, like, I, I think you're right. I think that both – the separatist worlds, I feel like, is where we should be spending our time because I think both – a lot of the rebellion would start there. But there's a lot of people who would think, well, good. This this is what we wanted. We wanted 
you know, someone to take control rather than just this namby-pamby republic that was doing nothing. Are you telling me that Palpatine drained the swamp? <laughs> yep. Like, that's I never exactly thought about it that way, but you're exactly right. Like, that's the separatist way to support the Empire, is to see that Palpatine drained the swamp. Well, and, and in that very, like, he, he's going to claim it. I mean, the same, yeah. very clear, like, but, but also I think what he then did was he said, the Jedi are the swamp. Mm-hmm. You thought this whole time it was the Republic, but really it was the Jedi. And so if we take the Republic, get rid of the Jedi, make it more controlling, the swamp is drained. Which I love that's so good. <laughs> which feeds directly into something I've been trying to find a way to bring in, which is in the Tarkin book. There's a big plot or a little a little plot thing mentioned about the fact that to most people in throughout the galaxy, Dooku was a Jedi. He was a dude with a lightsaber who did magic tricks. He was a Jedi. So when the Jedi were deemed to be evil enemies of the of the Republic and everything, enemies of the Empire, it was just thought, oh, well, Dooku was just a master conspiracist who was still a Jedi who fabricated this whole war as a means of killing Palpatine, destroying the Republic and taking over. Like, it was further proof that the Separatists were awful. That's a great point. Yeah, I never thought about that, but you're right. That's exactly how it would be seen. Yeah, like it, it was something someone reminded me of and I went back and I picked up and I like reread through part of the Tarkin novel, which, by the way, not my favorite book. It's very James Luceno. It's very dry. But um, that moment was really nice because, yeah, Dooku was just a Jedi and the Jedi are corrupt and they don't know he was a Sith. And yeah, I can tell you, no, I totally left the Jedi Order. But when the Jedi turn out to be a bunch of lying, backstabbing scumbags in your mind, what are you going to think about that guy? Right. Well, because like you said, like you were wondering how does Anakin think the Jedi are evil. I actually, I I have that TikTok of yours saved in my to respond to (laughs) because I think it's very easy for him to think, A, because by that point, he thinks the Jedi have already started this rebellion against the Republic, but also because this has been the brainwashing that Palpatine and others have done. And I think, yeah, it isn't just Anakin. It's 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 everybody. Um, there's an extent to which I don't think this has ever been mentioned in the books, uh, legends or canon, but I would have loved to see a moment, and maybe Palpatine actually avoided it at all costs, but I would love to see Anakin and Dooku talk to each other. Like, where would that have been some kind of a connection between, especially because, you know, Anakin's path was started by Qui-Gon. Dooku is, is Qui-Gon's mentor. Like I can see there being a lot for those two to talk about. Um, I don't have, have it. Do any of you have, have any remembrance of it happening at any point, neither can Disney canon or legends canon? Not that I'm aware of, but I genuinely think that conversation would have been Palpatine's kryptonite. Like, I think if the two of them had actually come to an understanding of one another, they could have easily just taken out Palpatine. Yeah. And figured out a better way to lead the galaxy because they both want what's right. They're just being having this little devil in their ear telling them the incorrect way to deal with it. Which is exactly and so I why think you're- Anakin has, has Dooku killed. But, uh, Palpatine has Anakin kill Dooku. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's add that to the Qui-Gon Dooku thing with like conversations that you're right never happened. Like I've always said that Qui-Gon was the biggest thorn in Palpatine's side because he just has this natural ability to bring people back to the light. It's like his thing. And I do genuinely believe if anyone could have saved Dooku, it would have been Qui-Gon. But, like, you're right. In that same respect, Anakin would have probably realized all the BS that Palpatine was giving him if he just heard it from someone like Dooku first. Yeah. It's funny. We we know that the, the music, the Duel of the Fates, is because the, you know, this, this conversation of who will... of Will Qui-Gon win or not is so fundamental to everything because the conceit is, and I think this is believable, that Qui-Gon would have succeeded where Obi-Wan failed as as uh, Anakin's master. Um, and not necessarily because Obi-Wan bad, but just because of what 
what uh, Anakin needed. Yeah, he needed a father, idea- not a brother. Sorry. Right. Uh, and and but that Qui Gon would have been it. Maybe Qui Gon could have also saved Dooku because if he had been there, working with both Dooku and Anakin, you know, oh, that that his death becomes even more significant in that regard. Yeah, it's like you brought up Darth Plagueis the book, and there's there's a lot of things that don't quite work in canon. But the one thing that I do want to be reintroduced into canon that we don't have, even with all of the Dooku media we've gotten, we haven't gotten Palpatine seducing Dooku, or rather Palpatine, like, bringing Dooku into the fold. We've gotten them meeting for the first time in Dooku Jedi Lost through Rael Avaros, his first Padawan, and then we've gotten Tales of the Jedi, where they where he's already there what we haven't gotten is that moment in um in Darth Plagueis where we see how he essentially becomes Palpatine's apprentice that's yeah. the part that i'm missing yeah and i will say i liked tales of the jedi i had some problems with it i've talked about the ahsoka stuff already on a podcast i'll eventually do the dooku part but to me the most disappointing part about the dooku part was that he's already a Sith by that point that he's all that, that at least he's already enthralled to Palpatine and that's kind of killing Yaddle is kind of his final step I think that story would have been much more interesting if that's earlier on his journey mm-hmm. yeah it and it doesn't it doesn't play well like it works with the fact that we know Dooku had already left the order before this point we know that Dooku would just come back and visit and there was an open door policy with him because that we see that in Padawan but it is not communicated well to the audience that Dooku is no longer a Jedi at that point like he is not on the council he's not a Jedi master he's already left 10 years be- five years before something like that right I had I didn't know that at all. So like you're mm-hmm. saying the scene with Yaddle, you're saying by the time Qui Gon Jinn dies, he's already left the Jedi yep, Order. He left the Jedi Order before um, before Qui Gon and Obi Wan ever became trainees. Like um, and, and, uh, I think it's, okay. that's the big difference between the Disney canon and the Legends canon. And that's yes, a, I think the story works much better if it's Qui Gon that causes him to leave. But yeah, in the in the current Disney canon, we have. That, that's now set up. Yeah. It, yeah. So along with the Disney canon, he had already left because of the, the happenings on Sereno. I believe it's like nine years before Phantom Menace. But he would frequent the Jedi Temple. Like he would just come back and hang out because that's where all his friends were. Because he was on the Jedi Council when he decided to leave. And then um, he would, like I said, he would come back and visit every now and then. And then um, people just knew him they still called him master dooku because that it was just a matter of respect but that you're right like in tales of the jedi you would have no idea that he wasn't still playing both sides of the fence yeah and so then i have a follow-up question in the second episode of tales of the jedi where it's dooku and mace and they go to figure out if or how this Jedi Master died. Mm. Was it an accident? Was she murdered? What's going on? Or Dooku wants to find out why. Mace just wants to transport the body back to Coruscant. And so at that time, is Dooku also on the council? No. That's what's see, this okay. is where it's weird. I will admit, this is the <laughs> weirdest thing. This was my one incongruous moment. Is cause so it that would have been before Dooku leaves the order. He is also mm-hmm. not on the council yet because of the way he talks about Mace's appointment. But exactly. But yeah. then that begs the question, why is Mace not on the council or at least mentioned to be on the council in Dooku Jedi Lost? Now, he could be because we're not told who all of the Jedi are on the council. He could just be a non-speaking role in that book, so to speak. But why since it is an audiobook we don't get everything um but yeah is mace on the council i guess he is we just don't hear him talk but you're right that feels weird because he becomes a he mace becomes a master 
then Dooku beca- or becomes a council member, then Dooku becomes a council member, then Dooku leaves the council, then for some reason, Sifo Diaz, who was absolutely crazy, barely coherent, becomes a member of the council. It's there's a lot of weird stuff that Dooku Jedi lost, like muddles. And yeah, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 Star Wars universe, I think, has a good deal of internal consistency, but especially in the Legends books, and I think even sometimes in the in the canon books. You get a sense that an author hasn't really read all the, you know, isn't as locked into the other stuff or just where, like, in this case, I don't blame the author of Dooku Lost. I don't think there is a coherent story about what happens to force users who leave the Jedi. Um, we know Ahsoka does in, in through very hard circumstances. Dooku wants to. Uh, we're told that only like 17 others have done it in the like thousands of years of history of the Jedi. Um it's not a consistent thing, and I, I do wish it was more because I think <clears> – <throat> like, yeah, the, to me, as people pointed out, Ahsoka's story and Dooku's story really mirror each other in a lot of ways, and uh, especially with the way they both wind up. And I just, I just wish that was a little more consistent in those stories. Yeah, it doesn't help that Filoni uh, – my biggest criticism of Dave Filoni is that he doesn't seem to care about outside out, – media outside his own – and the movies like because this isn't the first time that he's kind of ignored other media look at you know you talked about the ahsoka novel and the final episode of ahsoka but or of the of tales of the jedi but yeah that for a universe that boasts such heavy in universe consistency that is annoying <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. pretty sure and i think there's a whole other discussion, but I, I think part of it is that what they were trying to do of saying that all the books and all the comic books are going to be equally as canonical as everything on screen, I just don't know if that's sustainable long term, especially when a significant part of your audience is just never going to read the stuff. Um, but that gets into a whole other set of questions. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it is like we mentioned Dr. Afra in a previous episode how do you bring her into canon and only tell new stories without touching on any of the stuff or re- rehashing old stuff? You're you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, let me let me start to wrap up. So let me just close with this question of for each of you, and Aaron, we'll start with you. How do you think Dooku should be remembered in the Star Wars universe? And again, putting us like in a world where like we don't know that he was a Sith. Like, how do you think his, the history of the Jedi of the Star Wars universe should remember Dooku, uh, you know, as a heroic figure, as as a, a villainous figure, as a tragic figure? As h- how do you think his story should be told? Um, I mean, I kind of think by the time all the clones die, who else is there to see him as a villain? You know, the Jedi are gone. The Jedi are dead. They're the only ones who maybe knew he was a Sith. The clones were the ones who were, you know, up close and personal. Like, they really had separatist bad mindset. But, like, yeah, I feel like, like we said before, how the separatists basically are the rebels. Right. I feel like he would be, like you were saying, a poster on someone's wall. Or, like, they'd have framed quotes just around the house. Like, I think he would be this big inspirational character of, Look at what you can do if you believe you can change the system enough. You can create your own independent systems. You can fight for what's right, even if it doesn't go well. Like, Dooku tried. Now let's do it better. I kind of think that that's how he would be seen. Mm-hmm. As far as within the Empire, I'm I'm not sure. Right. AJ? I really... This is currently my most fascinating question in Star Wars because there are Republic senators like Mon Mothma, Bail Organa. How do they feel about Dooku now that they've seen what the Republic became? How do they feel about that? I want to know, you know, did Leia Organa go to college with people who, like, sympathized with Dooku? What do the sequel era textbooks say about the, the the history of the Clone Wars, about the legacy of Count Dooku. And I, I genuinely believe, like I said, that he's going to go down 
in universe as a character like a Che Guevara, who's just going to be incredibly polarizing to specific groups who are going to have those people who are like, this is a hero. He was the first anti-imperial. He called it. He told you it was bad. And then there are other people who are like, yeah, but he did this by starting a war that killed you know, millions of people that ravaged worlds that led to the very thing he said he was going to do. I think that there are going to be like university symposiums, debates held to Count Dooku. And I am far more interested in the legacy of Count Dooku past the Clone Wars than I mm-hmm. ever have been interested in count dooku the character and he's like top two most fascinating characters to me but that impact that he has on the galaxy is something that i really really hope we get explored more going forward because i just think it's I, i just think it has so much potential to to tell a good story yeah, I think that there really is so much potential there, and and we've I've seen some of it explored, not Dooku, but the Separatists in uh, the book Leia Bloodlines, which uh, it, some of the others like not sequel era, but post Return of the Jedi books have done this, but this one especially, it's set like ten years after Endor. Uh, it's wow, well, it, it's and a lot of it's about the po- politics of the New Republic. And at this point, sort of two rival political factions have emerged, the two kind of political parties, one of which wants a more centralized, like, the the Republic has the power, kind of like a, a more like, you know, federal system. And the other is more of a, I mean, use the words, no, the other is more of a, like, keep local power where local is, like, let the planets, for the most part, self-govern. And it's framed somewhat in a, like, The book uses a little bit too much, I think, of the, like, again, civil war, like, local power equals states' rights to do terrible things. But but I think the the book is fairly even-handed. But certainly in the book, I think there's there's some really legitimate questions. I mean, in our own world of, like, you know, how much centralized power versus local communities or neighborhoods or areas, you know, governing themselves. But what the book also does is that certainly those people are often referencing the separatists and are often like, yeah, like, the separatists, we saw – like part of their fear of all the power laying with this new republic is like, look what happened to the empire, you know? And so that part of it is still alive and well. I also think it's interesting because like, and it's funny, you both answered the question that I hadn't meant to ask, although it was a really great question. I'm glad I did. I was more asking for you all knowing like all the different sides of Dooku, like how do you evaluate him? And, and I'll maybe kind of start by giving my, like, cause to me, he's like Luthen. He's a very mixed figure where I think – and again, I'm just kind of ignoring the, the idea of him as a, as a, as a Darth. Um, so that's why I'm framing it as like how would we remember him if we didn't know that because I think that part's stupid. But um, the, to me, he's – Luthen is someone who I think the things Luthen is doing are deplorable and I, I don't agree with them. But I know that it might have been necessary to overthrow the Empire. Dooku, I think, is doing even far more deplorable things. I mean, he, he's, there's a lot of stuff we see in the Clone Wars where it's very, like, horrible oppression of planets, you know, not freedom at all, slaughtering people, slaughtering all people, um, but for reasons that are right and or, or for his fears about what could happen are very true. And I'm rambling here a bit. I apologize, but where I'm all going, this is so I, I think of him as a very morally complex character who I – I want to side with a little bit, even though everything he does, I, I really can't do it. I think, therefore, that – back to kind of that first question, and I'm let you respond to all this in a second. What I think would happen is, as happens with, with characters like both Che and, and – like, I think Che, you're right, is a very polarizing figure. I, but to be clear of our – where – get rid of the biases, I think Reagan is exactly the same, you know, in that I think a lot of us – and. I'm more on the side. See Reagan as someone who did horribly destructive, terrible things to America. A lot of people see him as like the Reagan revolution, the person who saved America. And I 
you know, Tucker Carlson's and people like that have talked about having, you know, pictures of Reagan on their walls when they were teenagers. Uh, I'm much more on Chase's side than Reagan's, but it happens with both. But then what happens with both is then you get the slow drip of, okay, well, but remember this like terrible thing about the person, about Dooku. Um, and I think that would be the one more part of the conversation in that post-Republic world is you'd have people who hold up Dooku as a hero. And then someone else said, oh, but what about the slaughter of these people that Dooku did? And it would just be the debate about the person instead of the debate about the political points he's making. Um, long, long ramble, too long, didn't read. My, my point basically being... I think is Dugu is someone who is a very flawed messenger for a point that for a message that needed to be said. And I think that therefore to me it's really is a question of like, are we debating the messenger or are we debating his message? I think as a messenger he's terrible. I think his his message was fundamentally correct. Aaron, tell me all the reasons I'm wrong. Or that you didn't pay attention to this rambling too much. Um I did pay attention. <laughs> But I will say I actually have to drop out now and get going. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me, AJ. It was great to meet you. Ditto. Also, throwback to your Dooku impression. <laughs> really great, Sir Christopher Lee. Really great. Keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Um, well, to, to answer your question, um, I will say that it's it's so this is such a hard question to answer because George didn't give us an opportunity to have this question. Yeah, because George was so convinced like it. The problem with the prequels for me is that he wants to tell this nuanced political intrigue story, but he still wants to keep the Empire bad rebels good mentality of the originals like yeah. he still he wants count dooku to be darth vader you know he's dressed in all black he's got the red lightsaber bad guy he doesn't want there to be any discussion about whether or not he's potentially a good person so like and i think that's the problem is that all of these discussions exclude george's like actual description and like depiction, excuse me, of the character. Right. And like to compare him to Che Guevara, like the fact is revolutionary, you know, that he was, he was also the butcher of La Cabana. Like he was also like a man who did horrible things for a dictator. Like, and you can't, separate those two things and that's what makes him like like i agree with you about reagan and like i agree that the same things you're saying can be said about che and i don't want to make it a discussion about che guevara obviously because this is fiction but but it is like I, that's why i compare him to che for the sake of argument is because he is like i said simultaneously a revolutionary for the people and a murderer for a fascist dictator and like those two sides of the coin incredibly fascinating incredibly difficult to discuss because you can't you can't just say, oh, well, Dooku was a hero because he was fighting against the, the, you know, the regime that was the Republic that didn't care about its people while saying so you're while while also unintentionally saying the hero was the guy who slaughtered millions of people. The hero was the guy we see at the beginning of Dark Disciple who's willing to just like blow up a planet just because. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's the dichotomy there that makes it hard for me to take an actual position. I, I think you, what you're saying makes an awful lot of sense. And I think that's um, it, 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 what you said also, I think, really helps to speak to and I'll use my own experience here again, being very self deferential of idiot teenage me <laughs> um, of the way history would remember him. Because the fact is, like, I have now come to learn so much more about Che and find him, again, a very fascinating figure who did some, I think, great things and some terrible things. And, and all that has to be held in tension. If you had told 19-year-old me, 
who had only learned about Che from like the 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 other kind of like young radicals who were again all middle middle class or upper class white college kids who all thought we were great revolutionaries, um, I would have said, oh, that's all like capitalist propaganda. You know, I would have immediately written that off. And mm-hmm. I can easily imagine that's what would happen with Dooku. That there are people who would say Dooku is just like all these good things about Dooku and everything else is just imperial propaganda. And the way that I know that happened is now I really want to know, did the same thing happen with Darth Vader? What did Ben Solo get? Did Ben Solo get told, no, no, it was Tarkin who wanted to blow up Alderaan and Darth Vader only did it because he like had to go along with it or something like that. You know, that like Vader really wanted to fight the Emperor and if his son had only worked with him, all would have been better. Like, that's a good question. And I mean, you brought up Bloodline, which very clearly shows that at least in political circles, Vader was always the bad guy at least within the political sphere. But you're right. There probably would have been other people who might have excused. We see the Acolytes of the Beyond in the Aftermath trilogy. Like, they think Vader was a hero. Or the Acolytes of the whatever. Um, (laughs) When I put up that poster of Che, uh, sorry, I'm I'm probably more than pronouncing it. I apologize. Uh, But, you know, he was broadly considered by most Americans, certainly, as horrible and evil and terrible. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, we we did it to piss off our parents as much as anything else, yeah. you know? And so I can totally see that. Well, yeah, like Vader is universally hated. So, of course, Ben Solo is going to be drawn to that, you know? But I also think you're right. I think history is going to remember the good things that that in an era of revolution – like the the Republic era or the Rebellion era. You are going to find more people who remember Dooku for his rebellion than you are people who are going to remember his atrocities. Because, because that's the thing is when you're growing up in, you know, say the, the 70s, the 80s, you're going to see a figure like Che through solely that idealistic lens of rebellion and you're going to excuse like you said anything that's like oh well but he was also you know the the man in charge of the torturing you know history is going to soften those aspects of him in favor of the part that aligns with their morality with their politics And so I do genuinely believe that Princess Leia is going to grow up hearing just as many stories about Count Dooku the hero as she does Count Dooku the villain, and probably more about the heroic aspects of Dooku. I think the only real stain on his legacy is that idea that he was a Jedi. I think Mm. the fact that he was a Jedi who was a mass conspirator is the that's your other side of the coin in the universe. But yeah, in a time of rebellion, I think he's a hero. I think students the same age as Leia, I'd agree with you. I think given that Bail Organa was a big part of the sort of Republic anti-separatist stuff and and other things like that, I have trouble thinking and that he – didn't fully believe the Jedi were evil. Mm-hmm. Um, I have trouble believing that she, that Leia herself would have grown up hearing all that. Agreed. But I definitely agree with you that like that's that would have been taught during the time. Like I, it's so many things that we didn't think about when we were when people were writing these other stories. Like, what does Holdo think of Dooku? Yeah. Like we know about the friendship between Emil and Holdo and Leia from Leia, Princess of Alderaan. What if that's something that they disagree on? Yeah. You know, like there's there's just so much room to examine the separatist ideology post Clone Wars. I, I think I figure out how at least would be taught Imperial textbooks because, you know, Palpatine was brilliant at manipulating people and understanding things. And I think and if you look at history, this is often the way it happens is he would tell it as the Republic was noble and good, but was corrupt. 
The separatists had some good ideas about what was wrong with the Republic, but also had problems. But then the, Repub the, the separatists, like good noble Count Dooku, got taken over by the evil capitalist trade federation and all them. And like the story, I wonder if the story would emerge of that there was the good separatists, you know, like, to give an example. And as I said, I, I am very left wing in my politics and I have a lot of sympathy for some of the like, you know, communist ideologies, although I mm -hmm. think communism married to authoritarianism is often bad. But it's like I know people today who will be like, oh, Stalin was bad, but Lenin was good and right. And Lenin would have never wanted the things, but it was all Stalin. Like we know that Lenin was the person who ordered the you know starvation of the Ukraine and all those mm -hmm. kind of things. We know even Trotsky had some real problems. Um, but that's what history does is history – like if you have a, a, a bad movement – if you have a movement that had some good ideas but also some bad things, well, you just say it was just these people were the bad ones. But Dooku you – know, Neomodian's bad, Dooku good, and that's how it can be remembered. Yeah, and I, I genuinely do think that he would, given his throwing the Jedi under the bus, so to speak, I do think he he must lean heavy into that idea that at the end of the day, Dooku was just another Jedi. Right. And like, again, nobody knows that he was his partner. Everybody yeah, who it, could know that is pretty much dead. Mm -hmm. And it would sound like such an off-the-wall conspiracy that how easy would it be to write off, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I mean, if you write it off and plus you can go, man, you know, the CIS was right. They did have good ideas. There was problems with the Republic. But the reason that like you guys weren't taken care of, the reason you didn't win is because you had a Jedi pulling the strings the whole time and he was never really in it for you. Why don't you guys come back to the Empire I'll take good care of you. I kicked out the corrupt senators. We got rid of Count Dooku. You guys come back. And you know what? I'm going to fix the roads. Like you said, I'm going to standardize commerce. And like the fact that's that's another big thing is that those capitalism bad, capitalism not bad, capitalism good for the Empire. Because one of the first things the Empire does that we see in the first season of the Bad Batch is standardized currency throughout the Empire. Yep. The idea of galactic credits, he brought those separatists and their money into the empire and the first thing he did was go let's let's make the money match so that everybody has to work together because now even if you destroy the empire you still got good things you know and that's where you get the the populists or not not the populists in um bloodline you get the ones who are like oh well the empire wasn't bad it was just palpatine was bad so I'm going to make a little bit of a leap here, and I admit there's some head cannoning. I don't think this was at all intentional, but I think it kind of would line up right. In A New Hope, <clears throat> uh, Luke sells his speeder to someone else on Tatooine, so using whatever's the currency that Tatooine uh, has, and Han Solo accepts it. Compare that to when uh, Naboo credits or Republic credits are not acceptable on Tatooine. That's part of the Empire's legacy. And I, I think ding, you're right. Ding, and that's, ding, ding. Like, to me, part of why I find someone like Cyril such a fascinating character is is my can headcanon is, is that Cyril, like a lot of others, grew up during the chaos of the Clone Wars and all of that. And the Empire, like, part of what sets him on his journey is that he really thinks, like, there should be a rule of laws and of justice and that two men were killed. That's bad. We find the pun the, the person who killed them and and we, we deal with it. We deal out justice. And... What first infuriates him is the corporate corruption, and then he sees the Empire step in to take out that corruption. So, of course, he's going to get pulled in by that. And, um, I think and, he's wrong, but I get where he's coming from. And Marva was a separatist. Like, yeah. we know that. Like, we, like, so Cassian was raised as a separatist, essentially. Like, that ideology, and we see that he becomes a rebel. We don't know how the years line up. Not only does that that story show us that she was a separatist, but we don't know how the, the we don't know exactly how the years line up. But unless uh, Cassian is a lot younger than Diego Luna looks, that's probably a Republic ship that crashed on Cassian's home planet. Yeah, and that killed Cassian's, you know, and that that she was so afraid of. So yeah, it, yeah, we we know for certain. You're right. It, it was a Republic. Like that was a Republic versus separatist battle that was going on on that world, not an Imperial battle. 
And right. so, yeah, like <laughs> that's yet another person who's growing up with the idea that the Republic was bad and that the Empire is bad. Exactly. All right, well, I'm so glad you brought up this conversation. Uh, I'm going to put some links to the original TikToks and tweets that you had that kind of started this all off. Uh, but is there any other kind of last comments you want to make, or questions you want to bring up, or points you wanted to make? <laughs> I just, like I said, I I also, just to plug it, have a YouTube video where I talked about a lot of these different little things. Same name, Jedi mm-hmm. underscore Starkiller. Um, but I really do thank you for having me on to talk about this, because it is – difficult to talk about like i said because george lucas removed all nuance from the films and because of that this whole conversation is really just yeah but he was a sith the whole time Mm -hmm. yeah but he was just a bad guy the whole time and that it can be difficult to have these kind of conversations because people are right when they just pull that card out. That's exactly the point is, yeah, yeah he is just a villain. <laughs> but I, good. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing a similar version of that now uh, in a discussion that happened a lot on Twitter a couple of days ago when we were recording this about Thrawn, mm-hmm. where I think Thrawn is first, – first of all, I personally believe that there are three fundamentally different characters, Thrawn in the Heir to the Empire books, Thrawn in the new books, and Thrawn in Rebels. <laughs> But but I think there's a lot of interesting discussion to be had about the character of Thrawn, but it's so easy to be like, oh, but he worked for the Empire, so he's a fascist, which is true. But it, it's – for me, what that – kind of what that showed me is that as much as I love TikTok and Twitter, that it's very hard to really get into all the nuances of these conversations. And that's why I'm so glad you were willing to do this because to me that – what Amelia says is so let's do a podcast about it because that's where we can get into all the back and forth and that it's not so simple. And that we, Yeah, we can't just say – at the end of the day, Dooku good, Dooku bad. I mean, I think more, more, more good. I think more bad than good. But, but again, messenger versus message, and and all the different things that are happening, and and in some ways, this this whole question isn't even about what do we think. It's about how are the people in, in that universe would think. And and just to leave it with a hot take, because I don't want to spend any more of your time talking about Thrawn right now. I think with my little hot take, um, I think the first canon Thrawn novel is perhaps the most damaging to that character Mm. just because not only does it paint him like as the protagonist, but like it paints him as like an anti-slavery, um, you know, guy with a, a good friend that he loves in Eli Vanto. And like, it really does a good job of giving you sympathy for the devil because in every other case, like Thrawn is not a good person in any of his other appearances, that's the one appearance that really shows you him as a good guy. Like, not even the other two canon, or the other two in that trilogy, and even the Ascendancy books, none of them show Thrawn as as good as that book does. Yeah. I, 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 I somewhat disagree about the later books, but I do think you're correct, and I, it's why I say, yeah, I think it's fundamentally different character. I mean, it, the Rebels Thrawn, who opens fire on civilians, I fundamentally don't believe that the character in the book in that first book would do that. And mm-hmm. to some extent, I think it's a case of I, I love Timothy Zahn. I think he's written some great stuff. I'm really glad that they're bringing him back for things. But I do think that it's the case – like sometimes a writer will fall in love with their antagonist and start to slowly like rehabilitate their image and rehabilitate their image. And I'm like, yeah, I don't you remember how you originally wrote this character? And like – I. This will be a separate podcast, and I think you've just volunteered for it. Congratulations. But yeah, I think I think Thrawn is a great example of a character who just – there is so much complexity, but a lot of complexity is who's telling his story. And, and like it comes down to with Anakin, it comes down to with Dooku, but especially in the case of Thrawn, you cannot morally be a good person and align with fascism. Like – because and Thrawn specifically is the character who's like, well, it's for the greater good. If the greater good involves fascism, there's your problem. And the the fact is that like Dooku always knew what Palpatine's plan was. Anakin Anakin speaks to Padme in Attack of the Clones about how fascism is the right way to go. Like 
you you can see in all three of these characters that it's like it doesn't matter how noble your ideas are if your outcome is taking away the autonomy of other people to put them under the rule of one you're wrong you're the bad guy mm-hmm. like i think this would be a great discussion because i i definitely agree with some of what you're saying i also think that like book Thrawn, at least to me is not a good guy but is also i would i i think is a different different kind of bad and and i don't scales of bad are weird but to me like he is much more gray than a Vader or a Palpatine. Yeah, um, I would, and like I've, I've said before, I and we can we should have this discussion because I think he's also he's also the most sociopathic of the bunch in the sense that he does not care about people. It's all about rationalization and logic and numbers. Yeah, and I think that in some ways makes him scarier than a figure like like Dooku, because you can reason with a figure like Dooku. We see Dooku have that moment with Obi-Wan where he's like, I wish Qui-Gon were here. You know, we don't get those kind of moments with Thrawn. I mean, in some ways, and now we're deep into a different topic, (laughs) but I just need to say this. I think maybe the best comparison to Thrawn like that is like some of the Jedi. Uh, and in particular, I'll mention one who I know you you love to defend, but I think I think can be called out, Kyle Mundi, of being you know someone else who's just like he 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 believes in what he understands to be good, but it's for him it's all numbers. It's not like the the lives of the individual clones have value. It's the the greater good, so we can sacrifice this amount of clones to protect this amount of people and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, that that concept of being detached from all of them, it's just the difference between, like, emotional detachment and, like, I, I don't know, that's, that's a, that, you're right, this is a topic for another day, but, yep. but it does all fit into the idea that one thing I'll say as kind of a final thought is I love the way that podcasts like this creators like you and i and discussions like this are adding very adult very nuanced conversation to a project that was designed to be empire bad rebels good like it is essentially a children's story and i want other people to understand that that is not a a that is not defamatory. I don't say that. Like, children's literature is the most important type of literature. And, like, it is the most important type of message because you can communicate those things very easily about good and bad, right and wrong. Like, it's great that those are laid out. But then as you become older, one of the things about maturing is taking that stuff and asking, you know, was the the farmer in peter rabbit the bad guy what right. about the problems with the rabbit and like that is how we reach enlightenment that's how we reach education is truly understanding those very simple right and wrongs and breaking yeah. them down so i just think this is such an important conversation to have about all of these kind of topics and thank you again for giving me another opportunity to ramble on incessantly <laughs> about something that i really do love well i'm i'm so glad the mic is always open uh, i've learned so much from you and your perspectives as i said i at a time when i was very close to giving up on star wars content uh, your TikToks were a big part of what kind of pulled me back and, and kind of helped take off this podcast. So I'm really glad to have a conversation I get to have with you, with Aaron, with Danielle, with all the great people. So And and that includes all of you all out in fandom. So what do you all think of Dooku and, and how he would be remembered and, and all these conversations? Uh, were you the idiot with a Che Guevara uh, uh, poster on your wall? Or do you still have it because you still want to defend him? I think – I mean I'm not saying he's – well, that's a whole other topic to get into. <laughs> right. I, I still have less sympathy and admiration for the man. Mm-hmm. Um If you're someone with a Reagan poster on your wall, I don't think you're listening to this podcast, but if you are, (laughs) we'd love to know your thoughts too. Any of it, theethicalpanda.com, you'll find all the contact information. Uh, The show notes, you'll also find how to get in touch with AJ, all the ways to follow him. Uh, We'll have a link to that great YouTube video. Thank you all so much for being a part of this, and have a great day.